Now we're good to go. You're at Building with Privacy by Design. And good afternoon. My name is Naomi Freeman. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter at Naomi underscore Freeman. So feel free to ask me questions there. Or you can send me cat gifts. That would always be like super welcome. Just like pop them in like when I don't expect it. So I'm a software engineer and an entrepreneur. And last year I prototyped some artificial intelligence stuff, um, co-founded a company and took those to Silicon Valley. But for this presentation what's important is I was the lead developer at the Center for Social Innovation in Toronto. And I've also prototyped apps for major Canadian hospitals and international aid organizations. So one project I did that was super interesting was with Toronto Community Housing. And it was a new digital system for people living in social housing to submit repairs requests to. And a big challenge we encountered was, how do we keep this information secure, ensure the people doing the repairs have all of the information unlocked, and keep all of the back end anonymized and aggregate data and move information through APIs and all of that sort of thing. Which led me to chatting with an old coworker of mine from the hospital and to privacy by design, which is what we're here for. And this was long before GDPR was on anyone's radar. So while we don't have the time today to kind of go through all of the deep sort of technical stuff we encountered, what we're going to do is explore how technologists and developers can move forward and build with best practice and privacy by design in the wake of GDPR. So I'm going to use a couple of other apps to illustrate some of the common pitfalls and like some of what we're talking about today. So you might be familiar with this. A lot of GDPR looks something like this. Or like this. But it's actually a lot more than just legal jargon on a page that we have to send out to like a billion people who are super not interested. In long form, in case you don't know, GDPR is General Data Protection Regulations. And it was recently enacted by the EU to better protect the data of people who use websites and apps. It's really that simple. And the focus of all these conversations has been on users. But we're here today to sort of figure out what it means to be a builder and to actually implement GDPR. Uh, that should be a question mark. But why do we care? Like, why do we care about GDPR? Number one, uh, because EU data protection laws say we have to. And number two, because no one wants to be Zook in the middle of a Cambridge Analytica sc scandal. It's just, it's bad for business. And if it's bad for business, um, it's putting us in this room who work for businesses at risk. And we don't like that. We just want to like do our stuff, get in the computer, and be left alone. So let's try and do that. The framework I'm offering is one that comes out of Canadian Hospitals self-selected privacy rules. So Canadian Hospitals just said, great, we need to do this. Long before Facebook and GDPR, Canadian Hospitals were refusing to store data on American servers. And this became a huge point of tension between privacy offers, officers, the IT teams, and the administration. So hospitals don't often build in-house. They procure tenders and ask people to sell products to them, and then they choose one. And the problem was that many of the box solutions were being hosted on American servers. Uh-oh. I broke it. I did. I broke the internet. GDPR. Whew. <laughs> hmm? It's not doing a very good job on the Wi-Fi, that's for sure. Should I try and click this one then? 
Okay, there we go. So we're talking about procurement. Um, business and admin folks just want to go ahead and buy the programs that work best for their needs. Like, great, it looks shiny. Someone talked to me about it. I'm buying it. Awesome. Uh, but privacy protection folks' first interest was in protecting their patients' data. And then the IT folks got stuck sitting in the middle waiting for decisions. So many committee-type folks on many committees met many times over many years, and they came up with some great ideas about how we can manage data with the patient, or now the user, as the core focus. And the idea they came up with is that we lead with privacy. Like, privacy, first step. And the other idea is that privacy is not only paramount, but it's a right. We have a right to privacy and protections. Which makes sense when you think about the hospital context, but this idea of privacy as a right, data was central to that. So now these data, now these data principles created by Canadian hospitals are at the core of the GDPR legislation. You're welcome. Thank Canada. And this is what the framework looks like. You'll see it's five principles with privacy as the default and embedded privacy at the core. So that's the core of everything. The framework is meant to inform systems engineering design and to protect users' data. So each of these areas supports all of the areas around it. At the end of the day, everyone in every company becomes responsible and involved in the process of insurance, ensuring privacy by design is built into the system. So as you can see, we have things like end-to-end -end security, uh, user-centric systems, transparency, proactive and preventative actions, and the idea that all of these should be positive sum, like win-win situations, no trade-offs. Privacy by default means for our users that they should be able to log into our system, never click anything, and their privacy and consent wouldn't be arguable. So all these emails GDPR has been sending us are actually like not following privacy by design principles to begin with because we never asked them to send us these things. So how do you create a system that's 100% in compliance with data protection laws and regulations, user comfort, and zero user engagement. How do you make privacy the default setting in whatever you're working on? So like I said, first you don't email and harass people. You keep a user's data in the system for a defined time period. And if they don't log in during that time, you inactivate the account. Second, you prepare your system with that annoying email for when they do log in. You know, they're going to roll out of bed and come back to you at some point, hopefully. Beyond that, we move to embedded privacy. That's uh, the idea that privacy and privacy by default at the core, it's the whole entire system. You don't just, like, tag it on at the end. And even just looking at this completely non-realistic example, you can see how much more fragile the system on the right is compared to a system that is built with privacy as its very bones. It's a totally different setup. So with all of that in mind, I've downloaded a pretend app for you because conference Wi-Fi is great. And uh, we've downloaded this app because we want to know the opening hours of a pub. So you've downloaded it, you've got no idea what information the app is keeping, or how, or if it's keeping any information. What would we be looking for next when we are in this app? I'd be looking for a settings page, which we're not finding here at all. And we're left in this app with no settings page and no idea what's going on. And the implicit message here is that we, the users, have no control over our privacy. There is an implication that downloading the app probably grants some kind of consent for data sharing, but we don't know what. And this isn't meeting any of our privacy by design principles. So if it did meet the privacy by design principles, what could it look like? Uh, 
possibly something like this. And I know we don't all love the Twitter and they do a lot of terrible things, but there's some great reasons that this page and only this page, why it's working. There's individual consent options for everything. You can turn some things on and some things off. It's in plain English. If I have a question, how do I see my data? They helpfully have a subheader that says, see your Twitter data. Great. It's also really easily available from main settings screens where users already are. So coming back to our pub app, uh, if we go to the account page to edit our profile and see if we can change our privacy settings there, we see this, which is super informative. We can only edit our name and our email address. We should be able to edit our preferences, settings, app and data options, as well as export our information. So this again isn't meeting any of the principles. And all apps have to, even this silly pub app. So if we did update this profile page and make it great, um, these are some things to consider. So what data is actually essential to make the system go? Do you really need to know gender or sex? Do you really need to know someone's full name? If you could sit down and have only one piece of information that made your app go, what would it be? and you'd be surprised, it's usually not one of those two things. Once you have form fields, you need to send information somewhere and store it. So how are you protecting the information in transit? And do you need to separate the information to anonymize it? Which is bringing us to our next principle a little bit, transparency, both internal and external. In both cases, documentation is key, and you need to be able to explain what you're doing with information and why you're doing it. All of your practices can now be audited by the GDPR, so good documentation of process is gonna help you as much as it will help your users. As for your users, in order to collect data, they need to know in plain English what information is stored, why it's stored, if it's gonna be shared with third parties, and who, which third parties. You also need explicit consent to do so, and you need options, we're back to options, options, options. You need options for them to opt out of any part of this. So coming back to our app, if we go back and go directly into the privacy policy link, surely this is gonna help us figure out what's going on, right? And here we are, you can see it's a super blurry, like five page PDF from sometime in the 90s. And, you know, what are we missing here to actually make it useful? We've got no user controls. We've got no granular options. If we wanted to exercise control over our data, uh, we'd have to write an email or, like, maybe send something in the post. I'm not really sure. I don't know how you would reach these people. So it's not transparent. It's not user-centric. It's certainly not user-friendly. And you're creating a time delay for the user that's unacceptable for getting help. So there's just many not great things here. Don't do this. Don't upload documents into your privacy settings. As for third parties, um, PayPal, this is actually from their page. And they do a great job. And it's a little bit overwhelming. I'm not sure why you would go in there, but we can. We can go in and see over 600 of their third parties, and what type of thing they are, what kind of information they collect, and the purpose of why both of those things are happening. So this is really good. I would like it to be a lot prettier, but it's like a really good start. So the users need to know which third parties are necessary for the app and which ones aren't, on top of all that information. There's no distinction in our pub app between third parties whose services are necessary for transaction and those who aren't. So you might need PayPal as a necessary service to buy merch, buy a beer, something like that, but you probably don't actually need ad networks to make your app go as much as the business team might think so. 
So one page that I did come across while writing this talk actually does a superb job of meeting the GDPR guidelines. And what we have here is we have plain English and a very obvious title telling us what this is about. We have options, we've got legal guidelines, we even have the consequences outlined up front. No consent from the user, you are going to a plain text page, like right up front, which is really good. We love this. And when you go into their see details, there are so many details, many, many lovely details about age of consent, about what's going on in their app. Um, so when you're bored tonight, you can totally go here and see all their details. Other things your users are expecting to know and that you have to answer, who do I contact if I want to revoke my consent? How do I contact them? And what are the consequences, like we just saw, if I refuse to accept some or all of these conditions? Are you going to lock them out of everything on your site because they didn't want the ad network? You have to make that decision. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we're going to move into some large principles of data here. And I'm just going to get some water while I do that. So core to the privacy by design paradigm is the right to be forgotten, the idea that data has a life cycle. In Canadian hospitals, this is seven years. So some questions here to answer is, how long do you store your data and why? Government mandate is a really good reason, because it was our best meeting idea, is not. Uh, and once you know, then document the policy because we talked about that already. We need to make sure that we are taking care of data throughout the life cycle. So we're probably familiar with the data life cycle here. And it's just important to know that we need to conceptualize and execute at each of these stages, um, and that all of them are equally as important as any other. We also always need to know Who's responsible for the data at each part of the life cycle? So you need to explicitly assign someone to each stage internally, managing customers wherever it is, and have information on where to reach them, like telephone number, email, probably not post, but you could. Along with each stage of the journey, you're also responsible for protecting the data, which is called end-to-end -end security. And it's not enough to make sure the data is just securely stored. So how is your data being transported? How is it being collected? What else is being sent with it? As you know, data is more powerful when it's got other touch points. You don't want to create those touch points. We also have to be proactive and preventative about the protection of data. So let's get paranoid. Um, what's the worst case scenario for your end user if there's a breach? In the pub case, maybe someone learns someone else is not where they're meant to be and there's a lover's quarrel. <gasps> but in the case that I was working with, what if your user is a subsidized housing resident earning $600 a month? If this is their house and you put their information in a database and it can identify their unit number, their residence, and the fact that they have a broken lock or a window and they've submitted that in good faith to government repair systems because they live in government housing, you know, what is the greatest harm a bad actor can leverage from putting those pieces of data together? Even here, a stolen TV is devastating at that income level. It's probably the most valuable item the person owns, and they either saved for a long time or got it on a big sale or inherited it. For them, if that TV is taken, it's a non-fixable situation. And if you send a little tiny notice afterwards being like, hey, uh, we leaked some data, sorry, like that doesn't actually fix anything for them. You need to be preventative and proactive and know what the worst case scenario is before you go in there. So be as paranoid as possible in those design and vision meetings with the business team. It's our job, and everything is possible. Coming way back to our pub app again, in spite of this super suspicious app, uh, we're going to go down to the pub, 
and have a beer and check our emails anyway. So, you know, we're traveling and we don't know where else to go. So we're going to end up at this creepy pub. And when we get there, we try and get into the Wi-Fi, which looks pretty standard, which is problematic. There is a settings page just off screen, but it just provides links to those blurry legal documents that we saw before, which isn't helpful. So there's no settings, there's no options, there's no choices. This is not privacy by design. And they've set us up in this terrible situation. It's clear the only way we can ensure our privacy with this pub chain is to not use its app or its Wi-Fi at all. And this is a zero-sum dichotomy. One side wins, the other side loses. Privacy by design seeks to avoid this kind of situation. This app and Wi-Fi logins really left us in pickle. We have no Wi-Fi and no beer, or we have great privacy, and we don't know which. So how can we possibly do all of the things we're talking about and meet our business targets? Because you know someone's going to come in the room and, and start that conversation. The final part of privacy by design is creating positive sum win-win situations. So everyone wins rather than trading off, which is tough, but we're all really, really smart, and that's why they pay us a lot of money. And it can be fun. It can be fun to work with weird constraints. I really, really enjoyed it when I was working with these kinds of problems. So at the end of the day, that's really why the EU is enforcing these GDPR rules for people like us when we show up at the pub. These kinds of decisions don't really impact big business day to day. The whole thing, this privacy by design thing, is vague enough that users don't really understand what they're giving up. Or if they do, accessing the Wi-Fi while they're traveling is much more important. So it's on us as builders and designers and thinkers of these systems to really make a change. And if the inspirational impetus isn't enough, a uh, failure to report within 72 hours any kind of breach will result in 2 to 4% of your company's gross annual revenue, or up to 20 million euro, being flushed down the drain and eaten by the EU. So, I mean, it might be great for fixing some potholes and things, but I'm sure we'd rather not. So I know it was a little bit quick today and a couple of really simple examples, but I just wanted to use some of these illustrations to show you really easy ways we can implement GDPR. Of course, when you get into things like data aggregation and APIs and anonymization, there's a huge amount of technical thought to be put into how those things can be separated and rejoined. And like the project I was talking about, there is a lot of that to consider. But first, we need to get the very first layer and the fundamentals going so that we understand what the goal is. Because it's not enough to just have really well encrypted data or know where you're storing it. It's all of these pieces having to come together in a really holistic way. And there's ways for everyone on your team to contribute. So thanks for listening. Um, Here's some places you can reach me. And I'm currently co-authoring a book. Uh, I'm going to post some things about privacy by design, some blog posts. So if you check in there over the next few days, that kind of stuff will be going up. And I just wanted to like wrap up and see if anyone had any questions um, about privacy by design, GDPR, any of that kind of thing. <laughs> Can I get on? Uh, having his lunch still. Sorry, Matt. Um, any questions here in the room? Uh, I've got a question that's been bugging me for a, a long time. I, I do some work with a thing called uh, InSafe, which is the European, it's kind of a, a European network of safer internet centers. Um, a lot of the focus is on kids. But I was at a, a, one of their events recently and I was talking about you know the GDPR, and uh, if you go to if you go to something like I read the Guardian to see what's happening in Brexit land, and you know you got the like the page you showed from PayPal, it takes you to that kind of page and shows you all the information, etc. 
And as a test, I just asked all of the people in the room, are they actually going to those pages and going through them and clicking on that stuff? And these are people that work in inter internet safety for young people and things. And everybody said no, they just say click and continue. So my question is, will that not, will it just become like the cookie? Well, it's like in Europe, you know, you've got this, the EU had the, the cookie thing where you have to click to continue, yes, you accept cookies or no, or whatever. Do you think that this will be the same thing with like the, this kind of compliance thing or on sites? And, and if so, how can we, how can we mitigate that? I think if companies did a good job and they don't want to do a good job, they've forced us into complacency because they hit us with all of this information at, all at once. And it could be, I want a beer. It could be, I need to know if flamingos have toes. Like, whatever it is, we just want to move to that information fast, get what we need, and perform the actions that we want to do. And companies so far have purposely made all of it dense because they're taking our data to sell it. They don't want to make it transparent. And one of the core principles here is transparency. And privacy by design is built into GDPR. But what we've seen already from companies is them sending these emails, and so many of them done in so many of the wrong ways. And then when you land on their page, you can't even opt out. So they're not implementing it well. The one that we saw here that was sort of that clearer page, data information stuff, read me. If you don't read me, you get a really boring website. If companies were compelled to do that, then we would be much more engaged with where is my information going and how do I stop that? But as you'll note, that was a, a public radio website. So they don't have any interest, I guess, in their business model in selling the data. So I do think if companies keep hitting us the way they have, for sure, we're going to just keep clicking through. Um, but I think what the EU is trying to do is bring it to a place where we can actually look at it and be like, no, you don't get to know what lawnmower I bought. I think we're a long way from there, given how much damage companies have done so far. In, in the kind of case of The Guardian, and you're clicking through, it's The Guardian site you're visiting, and they're sending you off to investigate privacy policies of all of those companies. <laughs> so it's like, finally, I just said yes, because fuck it, I'm not going to spend my afternoon reading privacy policies of the 600 companies that The Guardian are feeding me to. And it's on, it's on companies to be making these, if your four-year-old can't understand the, the print that's in front of you, the company has not done this, like, according to the way they're supposed to do it. They're supposed to make it dumb, and they don't want to. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Any further questions in the room? Okay, well, thanks very much. Thanks.